he's going to be giving us a lowdown on Dockerizing Django. Um, Ernst is a product marketing manager for PyCharm. Um, so yeah, please go visit them out. They've got a booth here as well. Um, he, uh, during his day job, is writing about PyCharm and Python and aims to make PyCharm better for Python developers. Uh, he's currently living in Munich, but has lived in many other places, enjoys traveling and food. So welcome to Southeast Asia. We love food and we love traveling to eat food too. So <laughs> you should feel right at home. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, with that, yeah, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess you kind of like said everything that I was gonna say here. I'm Ernst, I live in Munich. I'm happy to be in Singapore where there's amazing food around every corner. Um, if you do happen to know an amazing place that I, don't, that I should know about, feel free to come visit us at the booth and let me know about it. If you wanna visit us at the booth just to know more about PyCharm, we can help you with that as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much for attending my talk. All right, so let's get started. Um, the plan for today is first having a look at uh, what Docker is, then we're going to have a discussion about why Docker is a good thing and why you may want to like, put in the effort to use Docker for your projects. At this point in the talk, you have a decision to make. Did I make sense? Is Docker good for you? Then, awesome, stay seated. If not, I'm sure there's a nice bar nearby. Um, they'll sell beer to you. Just don't come back and throw the empty bottle at me because even though I do have a lot of confidence in the Singaporean healthcare system, I'd really prefer not to try it out. If you are convinced, after I will have a look in how to use Docker and finally how to go from a, from a development container to a production ready container, which means upgrading several bits, we'll get into the details then. So what's Docker? Anybody have an idea what Docker is? Has any of you worked with Docker before? Show of hands. That's a good amount of people, so half of my talk is pretty useless for y'all. Cool. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, you might have heard of like uh, something about Wheels, right? Um, Docker is actually not about Wheels entirely. It is also a system for containerizing your application. What is containerizing? Um, I guess for those of you who live in Singapore, you've seen those big ships before with the containers on them. I um, don't know if you guys know what it was like before containers existed. Before there were containers, if you wanted to ship stuff from point A to point B, um, you had to actually like load individual items onto the boat. So if you wanted to ship, let's say, um, What's a good example? Uh, pasta from Italy to New York, which sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Um, you'd first, at the place where the pasta gets made, you'd have to like put it into the boxes, then the boxes go on the car. The boxes then have to be loaded individually from the car to a boat where you're sitting in a corner. Then when you get to the other side of the ocean, you have to load them again from the boat into the car, again, piece by piece, individual. And um, then the car goes to the restaurant where they finally get to some New Yorkers who've been waiting for some good food. Containers changed everything. When containers were introduced in the shipping industry, um, rather than having like all these different products which were had their individual size and their individual issues, you just have this one standard issue container. So now the Italian factory puts their boxes of pasta into the container. The container goes into a truck. The truck doesn't care what's in the container, it just cares it can carry a container. Then that container goes onto the boat. Again, the boat, it doesn't care the container and that's how it keeps going until it gets to its destination. A software container is kind of the same thing. A software container on the inside, you can do whatever you want. You can make your own environment, you can make it and specify it, but on the outside, a container is a container. So any platform that can run a container can run your container as well, no matter what specific things you're doing. Um, so to you as the user, a container feels an awful lot like a virtual machine. And you can, what I'm going to tell you now are essentially technical details and reasons why containers have some advantage over virtual machines. But in your day-to-day -day life, you can basically think a container is a virtual machine. Now, why isn't a container a virtual machine? A container is not a virtual machine because a virtual machine, you have a hypervisor, which is like a piece of software that emulates a computer. On top of that, you have an operating system running. The hypervisor gives it a virtual CPU, gives it some virtual memory, and maps that to the real physical CPU and memory, and then this operating system runs on this virtual hardware and has to have its own hardware abstraction layer and various other things that an operating system does. And on top of that, you have the libraries that support your application and other applications that support your application, and then you finally get your application that's on top of all this overhead. Docker 
and containers are basically a way to use Linux kernel features to get a isolated environment within the same operating system. So if you, um, even though to you it feels like a virtual machine, you're really running on the same OS and it's just a Linux kernel giving you a isolated environment with your own file system, you think, with your own CPU, you, it feels like to you, but really you're still using the same scheduler as everything else, you're still using the same kernel as everything else, so you have a lot less overhead. What does this mean? This means that when you're starting up a VM, you have to wait like three, four minutes before it's went, gone through all its booting and recognized its hardware, and finally it can start up your application and start up in a couple seconds. Also, because you have a lot less overhead, you can run a lot more containers on one piece of hardware than you could run virtual machines on the same piece of hardware because it's much easier to um, over-provision the hardware that you have because it can much more quickly be dynamically allocated as it's just happening on the operating system level. Cool, so now why is this a good thing? Why would you want to ship your application with a uh, with, with a virtual machine or with something that feels like a virtual machine. Well, I think every single one of you who have downloaded some open source project or worked with like a fairly complex project that one of your friends or co colleagues sent you have seen this before. When you go and install it and they say like, oh, it's very easy, you just git clone my repo, you're on pip install, and then you get this. Because something didn't compile, something doesn't work on your platform, something is wrong. The good thing about this container is that Containers are always the same. So if your container works on your computer, it will work 100% of the time on your probably on Amazon's computer, and it'll work always on the Kubernetes cluster, no matter where you put it. Sounds cool, doesn't it? And um, another thing is, I don't know if any of you have heard of the 12-factor app. Um, the 12-factor app is basically a set of 12 principles that um, people who are smarter than I recommend you follow when you're developing an application for the cloud. Um, one of the things they hammer on is dev prop parity. You want to make sure that your development environment is as similar as possible to your production environment. Of course, you cannot develop, well, if for every developer you have to buy a server park with 200 servers, that gets a little complex. So you're always going to have some differences, but the closer it gets, the better. And because these containers are exactly the same, whether they run on your computer or on your server, they make it a lot easier to have developments which look a lot more similar. And then these guys also recommend using um, environment variables to configure things, which makes it easy to hook up these things together. So locally, you give your application through the environment uh, connection string to your Postgres database, which is running in another container. On Amazon, if you're using RDS, you just have to swap out this one environment variable and that's it. You don't have to recompile anything, no chance of things breaking in the meantime. Cool. After this, um, now we have a container, where can we deploy it? The cool thing again is they're the same, so you can deploy them anywhere that supports them. So you can deploy them on Amazon. They have actually have two different uh, container hosting solutions at the moment. They have ECS, which is what they've been promoting for a while. And um, now they're actually also launching their own Kubernetes product. Last time that I checked, it's still in beta, but um, I would assume that soon a stable version will be released. So if you're starting a new project, you should definitely look into EKS. If you have something that needs to go out now, ECS is probably still a little bit more stable. ECS, um, like I've worked with the ECS before, and you have to do quite a lot of things yourself, which Kubernetes takes care of for you. So Kubernetes, especially because in the future it'll be bigger than it is now, is probably worth learning more than ECS in that sense, because ECS has a lot of idiosyncrasies which are specific to Amazon and specific to this implementation. Another, like I guess the reference implementation of Kubernetes runs at the, on the Google Cloud. Google has Google Kubernetes Engine and you can run your code there. If you don't want to use a specific host for Docker, you can also just use a simple VPS provider, whether that be an Amazon EC2 box, whether that be an uh, Azure uh, box or uh, anywhere else really. You just install Docker, you can run your container. Of course, uh, I, I just mentioned only Amazon and Google, but I'm sure that Azure has container hosting as well. And um, Heroku also has a service for hosting containers. Um, basically, if you have a container, hosting is pretty easy. So let's get started. Now, let's say we have a Django application. Then I'm sure, well, how many of you have used Django before? Oh, a good amount of people. How many of you who didn't use Django have used Flask before? 
All right, so if you have any Python web framework, if you're going to um, start your application for development, you're going to have a command like this. This is the specific Django command, but for Flask, it's um, with the new Flask lights, I think it's just Flask run. And if you use Pyramid or anything else, you have a similar command that you run on your local CLI or through the PyCharm run interface to make your, your application start and for you to be able to run it locally. Now, if we want to put this in a Docker container, it's actually very, very simple. We take a Docker file, we write a couple of lines in it. We say we want to have a, a Python environment. Then we say um, we're going to put our files in the slash app directory, which again is in this uh, uh, file, like it's completely isolated from the rest of your operating system. Then we're going to copy in our requirements, pip install requirements, copy in the rest of your application. We need to tell Docker that we are going to expose port 8000. And then we copy this command, which we had earlier, and set that as a default command for this container. So now, why does this work? Well, first we have from Python 3.6. What does this mean? This means that we're going to download um, the Python uh, image from Docker Hub. Docker Hub is a great place. A lot of software that you've been using already has images that are pre-made. So if you are using Apache, you don't you can just get an Apache container. Like, it's out there, it's ready. So um, we specify 3.6 because we specify a version. If you don't specify, like you can specify latest and then you'll just get whatever the newest version is, but by saying 3.6, we make sure that our container doesn't suddenly become incompatible and our builds remain consistent. After this, we copied requirements.txt. A Docker file works with layers. So this bottom thing, what this does is it takes this Python 3.6 image from Docker Hub and pulls it down to our computer. At this point, the Docker engine will start up this image, create a container based out of it, and then it'll copy this file in, and then at that point, it'll snapshot it and make a new layer. These layers are read-only. That means that everything in the layer under the current layer does not change ever. You can remove something, but if you remove something, that means that it's still there, which is marked as not there anymore. Similarly, like if you have a Git repo if you have a file and you delete it later it's still there but it's not really there anymore in the latest version important thing to keep in mind when you want to have small docker images so at this point we're running pip install so we start up this layer we run this command which makes some changes from the file system at this point we snapshot it and we're done with that then we copy in the rest of our application and finally we set um, the command that we had this command is just a default command. So if we docker run the image that was created here without specifying another command, this will get run. We can always run another command just by supplying it to docker. Now, can anybody tell me why I'm separate copying the application? Any volunteers? Virtual environment, the environment first. Um, but so what I'm doing here, um, by first copying the requirements section and installing, um, like if we build this image, Docker caches all their layers and layers are read-only, right? So if I'm not changing any requirements and I'm copying in the application and then running pip install, but I change like an image or like um, a template or something small, if I put it in one command, it would first say like, hey, wait, this changed, and then it would rerun the pip install every single time it's rebuilt your image. By doing this, if you don't change your requirements, it'll be like, hey, wait, nothing changed, cached, let's go. So this builds way quicker the second time that you're building it, if you're not changing your requirements, than it would if you put it in one single command. Now, based on our source code, Docker build will create an image, and then Docker run will create a container based on that image. The image container relationship is kind of like a class and an instance of this class. So you define an image and then I can start up multiple containers based on the same image. So if you want to scale horizontally, it's very simple. You create one image and then you just say to Docker, give me five instances of this image and then you can point your load balancer at all of them and that's it. Now back to our Django application. Um, a Django application doesn't live by itself. A Django application needs a database. I'm sure there are Django applications that don't have databases, but they are very, very rare. So the cool thing about Docker is that, remember Docker Hub? There's Postgres on there. We can just pull Postgres down and tell Docker, like, we actually want to have two containers. We want to have the container that we just built with our um, website in it. And we want to have uh, a Postgres database container as well. Make them work together, and everything is good. Now, we do have to tell Docker to expose certain ports. Um, 
we told that we want to have port 8000 exposed, but in order to be able to access it from our own computer, because this container is its own little world, this has its own little network and its own little file system, everything there is, is, is isolated. So we tell Docker we want to expose port 8000, but if you want to be able to see it from localhost, we actually need to put in a port forward. We need to tell Docker Compose, which runs our containers, that we want to forward port 8000 or localhost to 8000 of our container. We're also going to forward port 5432 from our local host to the Postgres container. We don't need to do this. If you leave this out, it'll still work because internally these two containers can talk to each other. Within the Docker universe, that's fine. However, if we want to be able to talk from our host to the database, we need to tell Docker that we also want to forward this port from our local computer into the container. So what does this look like? Well, there's this tool called Docker Compose, which allows you to compose an application based on multiple containers. And uh, we're taking our current folder and building the, the web. Uh, let me also point on the other side here because I'm just pointing on one side that's not very nice for you guys. Um, so we're building the web container, which is in our current directory. And then we're um, exposing the port as I mentioned, and we're linking it to the database container. The link statement is actually rather unnecessary, but I like it because it makes it very clear that we're linking one part to the other part. Um, then we add the database container. This we don't build, we just pull it. We just tell it like, okay, I want to have this image. It's going to come from Docker Hub. I want a Postgres 9.6. And then, so this port statement here, the port statement here is the one that is, that I just mentioned. That we want to forward post port 5432 of our local computer into port 5432 of this specific container. And then finally, we set our Postgres password to the most secure password that's humanly possible because we need to, right? Okay, at this point, we can start this. And um, in order to make it work, all we have to do is run a com uh, command called docker compose up, which starts it and tell it to build it as well with dash dash build. This looks like this. Docker will take our files, give it all to the Docker daemon, which is um, basically the environment in which all these Docker containers run. If you're running on Windows or on Mac, basically it starts up a Linux VM to do this. Then it builds it layer by layer, and then it starts it up, and it will show you the standard output of your application of all containers. Here we only see output from the database container, but if there were output from the web container as well, uh, it would be interspersed. Now let's have a look to see what this looks like in PyCharm, because I still work for JetBrains, right? Um, if we're using PyCharm, um, the cool thing is, where is my mouse? I think it is completely lost. Increase the font size. Increase the font size. Um, yeah, it works. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, so here I have a, um, a Docker project. Uh, now it's in presentation mode, which means that I don't have my tabs. Uh, Okay, this is the Docker file that I'm using here. It's slightly more complex, but it basically does the same thing. Um, and then we have the compose file, which is also again, basically the same thing. We have a web container with a database container. This is a slightly more advanced version, which already configures the database through the environment here. But it's basically, again, the same thing. So in PyCharm, if you go to your settings, and then you go to your project settings and your project interpreter, to make a project work with uh, Docker Compose, what you need to do is to go here and just add it where you would usually add a virtual env or a con environment and go to the bottom and click Docker Compose. Make sure you have your Compose file selected, should automatically find it, but if you gave it a strange name, maybe it's different. And then here you click the service you want to debug later. We can not debug the database container, so we'll just put the web container here. And after you've done that, I'm canceling out here because I've already had it con configured. We can just go to run and run a regular Django run configuration. This is not nothing special. This is just the same as everything else. Let me just show you here in edit configurations. This is just a Django server run configuration like you would use in a local um, virtual end. We can debug, which starts in a Docker container. And so we can see here, this is the output from Docker that we're, we're um, attaching to the container. Now, let me create a browser window so we can navigate to the application. Let's register an account. Let's register an account called PyCon with the password 1234 because we need secure passwords, right? And now we have a um, 
an account where you can create to-dos because of course it's a to-do app. I think it's somewhere in the Human Convention on Human Rights that if you make any example application, it needs to be a to-do application. Um, at this point, we can put a breakpoint. So let's go to our um, views.py. And um, of course, I wanted to just run the sign up, but I forgot about this. So put, let's put a breakpoint in the add to do uh, route here. We'll go back to the browser, we'll add a to do, um, let's say debug a container. And there we go, we hit our breakpoint, which runs inside Docker. Pretty cool, right? Of course, now we could go and look into our database and all kinds of cool things, but let's move on with the rest of the talk. If you want to see the rest of the demo there, um, drop by our booth and ask me about it. And now I'll need to find my presentation back. There we go. All right, so here was the fallback screenshot, which we don't need. So now let's see how we can upgrade this to production. So we had the Django run server before, right? The Django development server, I don't know if any of you have ever read the documentation of Django. It's the same thing for Flask, by the way. It's the same thing for all of these Python frameworks. When you go to their docs, they tell you, um, do not ever, 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 ever use this server in production. Sometimes you hear of fun people who do this. Um, it is, I think it is also allowed to just make fun of these people. Like, come on, if somebody tells you, like, hey, I'm using the Django development server in production, they're going to get hacked soon, so, you know, discourage them from doing that. Now, what should we be using instead? There are various uh, application servers. The cool thing about uh, Python web applications, there's this interface called Whiskey. Um, the web standard gateway interface, if I'm not mistaken, it's like a four letter acronym, everybody calls it Whiskey, just like the drink. And um, there are several application servers that can do that. For example, if you use Apache, there's a mod Whiskey, which allows you to directly host it from Apache. I write that one. <laughs> cool, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, a uh, round of applause for Not Whiskey. <laughs> I'm not going to be using it today, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you could, so if you're not using Apache or using Nginx, um, there are other alternatives like Uwhiskey, which is um, a C based uh, whiskey host. And um, alter alternatively, there's also GUnicorn, which is based uh, essentially, uh, there was Unicorn, which was made for Ruby, but then somebody made it for Python, so now it's GUnicorn. And we're going to be using that today. Is it better than the others? Probably not. Just use whatever you want to use, but Geonicorn is nice and easy and it's written in Python. So if we want to switch to Geonicorn, it's actually very simple. All we need to do is to pip install Geonicorn. And then rather than running manage.py run server, we run Geonicorn Django Docker .whiskey. We still have to bind to 0.0.0. .0. This is very important. If we don't do this, it'll only be available to local hosts. If we start a server, whether it be run server, uh, Geonicor, or anything in a, uh, in a Docker container bound to 127.0.0.1, you'll be able to access that web server only from within the Docker container. Because again, it has its own network stack. So your computer is a remote host. Make sure to always run from 0.0.0.0. .0. We still pick port 8000, so we don't have to change other things. And so in our Docker file, it looks like this. We added Geonicorn to the requirements of text file, so we don't need to make a change there for the Docker file. But we just have to change the command from the run server command that we were using to the Geonicorn command. If we start this now, um, we will run into an issue. Has anybody ever switched to Geonicorn and knows what happens right now? If we started it now, oh, yes, that default. there you go. Like our application would work, but it would look very ugly because none of our CSS would work, none of our JavaScript would work, none of our images would be shown. So we actually have to add a web server in front of our Geonicorn. I'm sorry, again, I'm going to be using Nginx today. So uh, we're going to be using Nginx to both serve our static files and to reverse proxy Django. Sounds complex, it really isn't. All we're really doing is putting Nginx in front of our Django, so um, all of our requests first go to Nginx. If Nginx has the file, which will be the case for the static files, Nginx will reply and give it back. If Nginx does not have the file, so for any of our dynamic routes, it'll just forward the same request to Django. If you're using HTTPS, you can also like, terminate HTTPS at Nginx, so up to Nginx, everything will be HTTPS, and then on the way to Django, it'll just be standard HTTP, which makes your life quite a bit easier. 
Um, we could actually make it work like this, put an, uh, take an Nginx container from Docker Hub and add it to our compose file and make it run with three containers and then use a Docker volume. The static files are both available to our Django container and our Nginx container. A Docker volume is basically like a, a Samba share, like a mount of file system that you can connect to either your local host or between two containers and make sure that um, these files are available. We also did this earlier, I didn't explain this. Um, I added the volume where we added our current code into the container as well as a volume. That means that if you then make any changes on your local computer, they'll instantly be reflected on a container rather than you having to rebuild the container just for making small file changes. It's not necessary. If you don't do that, it'll still work, but you then need to rebuild whenever you make a change. So it's just a hack to make it a little bit faster. Um, I'm not going to do this though, because I think it's a lot easier to put Nginx on the same container as Django. I feel like these two applications, they are um, so linked together that we can hardly see them as, as separate. That's my opinion. I could be wrong. And there's definitely people who would do it on separate containers, but if you do separate containers, that means that you have your load balancing becomes more complex. If you, uh, because you're introducing a complete additional layer in your application, so then if you um, want to scale out, you would have one layer of load balancing from your users to your Nginx, and then from your Nginx, again, a load balancer to your Django servers. One layer of load balancing between your users coming in and then your web containers, making it look like this again, which we had before. Now, how do we do that? Now we have to, rather than go from the Python container that we just that was nicely prepared for us, we have to actually go from a standard. Um, actually, no, we're still using the Python container. Um, we're using the Python container, but uh, we're actually specifying now that we're using the Debian-based Python container. Now, Docker containers always have to be built from an op from a Linux distribution. You're always using a Linux kernel in the background. But your user space is, of course, still based on that of a specific distribution. So um, if you're using Debian, you get apt-get. If you use CentOS, you get uh, yum, I think. And um, a lot of uh, Docker users use Alpine, which is a much smaller distribution. Like this image will be about 750 megabytes. If you go with Alpine, because the Python image is like with Alpine, it's 8 megs, which is a huge space saving. I don't know Alpine, so I'm going to go for Debian. I'm just going to be honest about that. Uh, here, the first thing we need to do is install Nginx. Because we're using Debian, you can use, use a very simple apt-get inst install command. But can anybody tell me why I need to apt-get first update, then install, and then remove this, this folder? Does anybody have any ideas? Smart find sensors. Excellent. I like it when I have a smart audience. Um, it's considered best practice to remove this folder, which is where um, apt-get stores its, uh, like its repository. So if you run apt-get update, it pulls this down from the server, like which packages are there, and it stores it in this folder. However, in Docker, because what I said earlier, like if you have files and you leave them in your Docker container, if you, if you remove them later, they're still there. So they add size to your container. The Python image is already 600 megabytes, so let's not add more to that. But the thing is, because all other containers do this, we first need to run apt-get updates to get these repositories, then we can run our install, and then we need to remove them again, all in one layer. So that's why this um, command looks a lot more complex than just apt-get install dash y nginx. Then we copy in our nginx.config, and um, we need to run manage apply collect static to make sure that we put all the static files from Django in a folder that nginx can serve them from. And then finally, we change our commands to um, first start nginx and then start unicorn. Uh, we're actually going to bind unicorn to a Unix socket. I don't know if any of you have worked with a Unix socket before. A Unix socket is like a standard TCP socket, but it's on the file system. So um, it's harder for people to hack into it because it's not exposed to any network. And um, it's just a little bit faster because you don't have to actually go through the network stack to communicate between two processes here but the rest is the same. So what does our nginx config look like? It's the same thing as before, right? Like we just have to, um, like, like I mentioned, we have to serve our static files. And if we don't have the static file, we go to the server. This is in essence all this says. This says we have a static folder, which is in this folder. And if not, if it's anything else, we're gonna proxy pass to HTTP app server, which is our unicorn, which we're gonna access through our unicorn socket. 
Now we need to change a couple of Django settings if we want to configure and with anything else, and this is best practice, so do that. We do need to add this to our Docker file now with uh, placeholders because otherwise the collect static command will fail. And um, at this point, uh, you basically have a production ready image. What I'm not showing is how uh, you could run as a non root user, which is slightly more secure. Um, I'm not entirely sure what threats it protects again, but people smarter than I say that that's a good thing to do. Again, the Docker container is, like I think it has something to do with the Docker container being isolated, however, it still runs on the same kernel. So if somebody managed to escape the Docker containment and they're already root, then they're root on your entire server, which is a bad, bad thing. And of course, like I mentioned before, we can reduce the image size quite a bit by, for example, switching to Alpine. A simpler thing to switch to is just going to a Ubuntu base image, which already pulls the image size down from 750 megs to 230 megs, if you, but then you have to install Python. And then when you're done, you can run your application on ECS or EKS or wherever you want it and share your application instead of with just yourself with 10,000 of your closest friends. If you want to follow along at home and try this yourself, the application that I use to show this is available from my GitHub, github.com slash my name. If my name, it's Dutch and difficult, but it's on the schedule, so it's nice and easy to find, slash Django Docker. I guess that's nice and simple. And then um, the auth branch is a fairly simple one with three containers like I showed here today. If you want to see a more complex example, you can check the Celery branch, which adds a Celery queue and then a uh, an SMTP emulation server to s simulate how emails are being sent and uses five containers in total. Any questions? Fire. So what about the logs from the applications? How, how does that work? Did the container shut down or did it start again? So on localhost, um, Docker Compose will dump everything to standard out and then you can do with it whatever you want. If you are running in the cloud, um, where you're hosting will have a solution for this. For example, if you use um, ECS, you can use CloudWatch logs and if you configure that, all logs will be shipped to the CloudWatch server and you'll be able to look into them there. And what about daemonization? Is it, are these Docker, like daemonizing the service or blocking it? So, you know, if corn dies, um, this is, uh, there might be a feature like that in Docker Swarm. I'm not sure about Docker Compose, but if you're running on um, ECS or uh, Kubernetes, they all have health checks that you can use to kill off containers that are unhealthy and then new containers will be spun up in place. But this is something that, again, is something that will be specific to the cloud. And do you have to run both Docker and Nginx and Docker Compose on Django? Work. So Geonicorn actually runs Django. It doesn't run in front of Django. That's the thing that is actually running the Django. Um, and then, so if you only run Geonicorn, like uh, we mentioned earlier, you will not have your static file. So yes, you do need to combine Geonicorn with a web server if you want to do that. The other option is to use the white noise whiskey middleware package, and you can have um, your Python whiskey application host the static files for you. That avoids needing to use engine. But I'm pretty, like, I think the best practice is still to use Nginx or Apache or some web server in front of it, right? It really depends on how big your app is. If you're just a one-man shop doing a play app, you wouldn't bother with Nginx. You use white noise because it just avoids the complexity. Gotcha. Any further questions? All right, then thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, I will be at the booth here down the hall. Come visit me. Um, I can show you some more demos with how it works in PyCharm or can explain anything else that you would like to know about PyCharm or about Docker. Thank you so much. <laughs>